Inside Out 2 is officially here, and that means we now have 28 Pixar movies to rank from worst to best. This is personally for me my favorite ranking to do every time we get a new Pixar film, but as well as the hardest ranking that I could do, because most notably, if you followed me for a while, Pixar is my favorite film studio of all time, and as well as I love so many of their films. In fact, there's like maybe three or four on here that I just never care to rewatch, but that's gonna be different for every single one of you guys. So make sure to leave your thoughts down below, hit that like and subscribe button. And without further ado, let's get into our Pixar ranking of every single Pixar movie ranked worst to best, including the brand new Inside Out 2. Coming down in last place at number 28 is of course Cars 2. This is the most forgettable thing that I think Pixar's ever made. It's also one of the most not just even forgettable, it's also just one of the most generic things that they've ever made. This was clearly made to, yeah, we need to do a sequel to Cars because Cars makes us a ton of toy merchandise money. And as well, the first Cars did excellent and everyone loved it. And so they made Cars 2. Mater was the fan favorite. Let's make him the main character. And that just does not work here. Cars 2 for me is the only Pixar movie I've maybe only seen twice. I never have the eagerness to go back and rewatch this. And the way that I do my rankings when I reshift them and recategorize them is what do I feel like rewatching if I had to put it in order? And that's just how I feel in Cars 2. I don't care about it, and I'm sure you also don't care about it. Then at my number 27 is Brave. Now, Brave, when I first saw it, I remember really liking it. But again, its staying power just has not really stayed with me. And on the consistency basis, I just never really cared to rewatch this one either. It does feel less Pixar, more or Disney animated studio around like that bad time when they were making just generic okay movies and Brave kind of has that feeling it has a tale of nice family parallels but then the bear stuff comes in and you know it's silly it's fun but it just again feels forgettable it feels like a missed opportunity while I like Merida as a character and I wouldn't have minded to see a better story with her it's just the entire story centered around her that I just can't get on board with and again it's one of those Pixar's movies that I'm sitting here and I can't remember a lot and I don't really care to go put it on the TV right now. Brings me out to my number 26, which is Cars 3. Now, I've actually only seen this movie once, which was the first time that I watched it in theaters. And I remember sitting there going, the animation's nice, but the rest of this movie, again, kind of generic and a missed opportunity in some departments at least. I think this is like the true Cars sequel that we should have gotten after Cars and I think it would have fit for the tone of what we are going to do with Lightning McQueen's character. And part of me does want to rewatch this movie. I just don't own it. And it felt like a course correction overall for what Pixar was trying to do with this franchise. It was like, we really shit the bed with Cars 2. Let's try and fix it with Cars 3. And they elevate it to a certain degree, but again, just not that memorable. I did like Cruz though. I thought she was a cool character and I thought the animation was cool. But besides that, very forgettable. We jump into my number 25 and this is kind of where we start getting into a decent but okay category. And ne up next is The Good Dinosaur, which I just got done rewatching for I think the second or third time in my entire life. And still blown away by how fantastic the animation is. Still love Arlo as a character. Still love Spot as a character. I think the relationship is dynamite here. I think they are so wonderful with one another. But the entire journey they go on is kind of just something I've seen so many times before. In fact, in ways it kind of reminds me of Ice Age, just without a lot of the humor and more of just two characters who are the most unlikely duo going on an adventure. And the good dinosaur did go through a lot of development hell. I, I think a lot of people were even nervous if we were ever going to see this Pixar movie and it ended up coming out and it was decent. I mean, I said on my letterbox, this should be called the decent dinosaur because that, that's exactly how I feel in this movie. I don't hate it. I don't love it. Do I care to rewatch it? Not really. It's just decent. Now my number 24 is Finding Dory. Now I think this movie's funny. I think it's enjoyable. I like the new characters as well in here. It's primarily Hank the Octopus. I think Ed O'Neill does such an incredible job as that character. And I'm not just saying that because I'm watching Modern Family for the first time, but also just because I like how Hank works and I like his dynamic with Dory. I also like that Dory this time we get to learn a little bit more about her childhood, her family, where does she come from? And I think Finding Dory adds nice additions to the family and to everything that we would like to know more of. And I think now going back and watching Finding Nemo, this film kind of enhances that primarily from the Dory category. The rest of the film though, I don't think is that great. I think it's just okay. 
And again, it really comes down to would I rather rewatch Finding Nemo or would I rather rewatch Finding Dory? And it always just come down to I'd rather just rewatch Finding Nemo if I'm going to watch a fish story about trying to find someone in their family. Finding Dory's fine. It's just a nice, enjoyable side adventure that continues some fun, lovable moments with some of our favorite characters from Pixar's history. But again, I would rather just go back and rewatch the original. Now we get into my number 23, and that is The Incredibles 2, a film that just really doesn't hit that hard on every single rewatch. Now, don't get me wrong. I think there is quite a few great aspects to it. The animation is obviously stunning. I love how the villain's powers and how they're actually using them in here. The whole like hypnotist kind of view of it is freaky. But I also like the twisting of the characters, how it's really more of a Helen Parr story instead of a Bob Parr story. And I like that he has to stay with the kids this time. I think what that dynamic actually leads into is I'm hoping that eventually we do get an Incredibles 3 where it is more focusing in on the entire family as a whole. But if I'm to look at The Incredibles 2 as its own thing, I think what we first get here as a major pro is Helen Hunt as just a character. We get to develop this Mrs. Incredible so much more. And I think that's one of the glowing aspects of the film. On top of that, it is really fun to see Jack-Jack just screwing around with his dad and them all finally discovering his power set. But the one aspect that didn't work for me in here, and I actually thought it was going to, was all the other heroes being introduced. It's the one lackluster aspect of the story that I don't care about. And again, when I choose to rewatch The Incredibles 1 or Incredibles 2, I'd rather just rewatch the first Incredibles. That feels like the more special homage to everything I want. Again, I think Brad Bird did a really good job with The Incredibles 2. It's just not one of the highest things that I care to go back and rewatch, and I find some aspects of it to be a tad bit forgettable. Which brings me down to my number 22 now, and that is Monsters University, a movie that is absolutely hilarious, absolutely fun, and just missing the emotional core that I think was needed for this. And I think there's two ways that you could have brought about that, is either some more development time between my and Sully who really weren't the best as of friends yet and this is their origin story to getting there as well as the one thing that I've mentioned in every single one of the rankings is that the film should have ended with Mike and Sully telling their story to an adult boo who was about to go to college it just makes perfect sense but I digress I like seeing Randall as like the sniveling nerd and where he came from. I like seeing the development of their friendship and I like their take on a college party movie. This is Pixar at their first approach of really just doing a straightforward comedy. Did it work fully? Maybe not for everyone. Is it one of the films that when I watch, I laugh a lot at? Yes. Is it one that I've rewatched a lot? No, but anytime it is on, I will stop and watch a couple minutes of it or maybe half the movie at least, and I'll have a damn good time with it. Now it brings me down to my number 21, and that is Cars. Now, I will say this about Cars is that this was a lot lower the last time I did my ranking, but the reason it went up is I went to Disneyland, we went to Radiator Springs, I was in the mood, I put on Cars, and I just watched it, and I'm like, you know, this is a really sweet movie. It's very typical in its storyline. You know where it's going to go. But the characters itself, the aspect and the culture of Radiator Springs, and all those little sensibilities just kind of won me over this time around. Where I just sat there watching Cars and I'm like, I have a big smile on my face. And I don't know why. Could it be because of Owen Wilson's grand voice as Lightning McQueen? ka -chow? Could be. But it also could be because Larry the Cable Guy as Toe Mater was like the perfect essence. The way they used him in this first film was great. I also love Doc Hudson and I love this comeback story of Lightning McQueen and how he's really much finding himself and not being a dick. This is a story that a lot of kids and teenagers should grow up with and I think Cars in a way is a humbling approach to certain people who maybe are just kind of a jerk when it comes down to sports. A lot of different aspects of Cars, but it's an enjoyable one and I know a lot of people grew up with it. I know it'll probably be a lot higher for some of you out there. For me, this is the perfect spot for it. That brings me down to my number 20 and that is A Bug's Life, which I actually also rewatched later earlier this year. And it's another one that I hadn't seen in forever. I always really liked it. I think as a kid on the VHS, it was the old man playing chess that I remembered the most out of watching this movie because I was always fascinated by that short and always really liked it. But now again, I'm, I'm rambling on. Bugs Life is awesome. I, I really like Bugs Life. It has some nice little humors to it. I love the circus bugs and how Flick is trying to make them these warriors and 
they're coming up with all these different ideas and this David versus Goliath story that while they premiered this right after Toy Story and this was Pixar's follow up to it, maybe at the time it wasn't the biggest thing, but when you go back and watch it, it has a lot of clever moments to it. And I can't help but smile and laugh. The circus bugs in here are some of the best aspects. Heimlich for the win. As well as Flick. I think Flick and Dot are absolutely great characters that I love to spend time with. When I watch Bugs Life, I love spending time with the bugs. The only time you ever hear me saying, yeah, I like to spend time with bugs. On my number 19, this might surprise some of you because this was a lot higher on my list the last time I did a ranking, but that is Lightyear. In the, as of right now, I'm just not really in the mood to go back and rewatch Lightyear personally. And while I did love it when I saw it in theaters, and I still, for a lot of the film, I still do love it. Like 19 and up, I can truly say that I love each and every one of these movies, and I could swap around a lot of these movies on my ranking as of right now. But I also understand that Lightyear wasn't really everyone's cup of tea. But for me, as someone who's a diehard Toy Story fan, Toy Story is like, spoiler alert, like one of my favorite things in the entire world. And you can probably take a guess. Of, well, it will probably be my number one. But Lightyear for me is just what exactly I wanted to see as like a progression. I liked seeing that this was Andy's favorite movie growing up. This is like what he saw. And I think there's aspects that now looking back are a little bit missed in terms of like bringing that aspect to life. But as a fun sci-fi romp from Pixar... It's great. I like it. And that's kind of the same way that I look at Monsters University. That's a college party film taking a different approach in a franchise that we already know. And Lightyear is kind of the same way. A franchise that we already know, redefining it, but more as this sci-fi epic grand adventure that's just fun. And maybe has these bigger and grander scale ideas. Like the whole part of Buzz going back and forth and losing and missing all that time, weirdly enough, hits me emotionally. And I don't know. It just really got to me. And anytime I go back to rewatch Lightyear, that was one of the things that also hits me in my heartstrings. It also socks the cat. Awesome character. Get into my number 18, which is Turning Red, which I think Turning Red just has one of the most biggest and vibrant directorial premieres ever from a director. And Domi Shi, I think, did an amazing job with Turning Red. Turning Red is one of those movies that, like, when I go back and think about, I just love the anime influences in there, the culture that's all pouring through the film and its veins, and specifically the mother-daughter relationship and how that is playing out. And it's also very interesting how we get a film about puberty with a red panda in a completely different culture and in a completely different situation. And then we also over here on a different level have Inside Out 2, which is also dealing with puberty for kids. Two different approaches, some that maybe people will prefer the one than the other. Turning Red for me is an enjoyable Pixar romp that has so much entertaining values and it's not gonna work for everybody, but it's one of those movies that definitely puts a smile on my face. Now my number 17 is Onward. Now, Onward was one of the biggest surprises for me. When they announced they were going to be doing a fantasy movie, I honestly kind of low-key rolled my eyes at the thought of this. Then I found out it's about two brothers who lost their dad, and for one day, they get a spell to bring him back to life. But what happens when that spell only brings half his body to life? Well, they got to go figure out how to fix that. And Onward, man, I, I think it's great. Um... I, I, again, it just, it tugs at the heartstrings. It hits all those emotional values and seeing this brotherly tale of two brothers going on this adventure to have one last day with their dad is just devastating. Um, and while I'm very lucky to have my dad still in my life, there are multiple people in my life who have seen this movie and I've talked with them and had this experience and watched the film with them and they don't have their father or they don't have a parent figure in their life anymore. And it hits for them on such a different level. And I think back to like how they felt watching this movie. And I just found it to be special. It's one of those special memories that I do now have. I also think within Onward, what's so special about it is the fact that it builds up a nice world. And it builds up this fantasy world that, you know, we see so many things that are fantasy. But the fact that they're able to delve into it, but tell such a sincere story and also have a fun road trip at the same time. It's just grand. And that's what Pixar does is playing on different things that we maybe have seen before. And when they execute it greatly, you just have a big smile on your face. Now brings me down to my number 16, which is Luca. Luca for me is kind of special. I know it's a movie that's really about nothing but just two boys in their summer vacation. But that's kind of one of the greatest things about the movie. Well, I can't say I've been to Italy, but I am Italian and my family's Italian. And there's a lot of cultural avenues of what Luca has within it that reminds me of my family. The thing that Luca really hits home for me 
is that one summer vacation that you have with one of your closest best friends and you have so many core memories to it to no matter how small or big it is, you can really go off. And for them, it's very much a Vespa race and wanting to get this Vespa. And so small and so dumb and so minuscule, but it really brings back those childhood memories. And also, of course, Silencio Bruno! Luca's that joyful summer movie that I love just playing randomly whenever I'm doing something else and finding my attention and watching the entire film because I'm obsessed with it. And I'm obsessed with the characters and I'm obsessed with the entire concept. And again, the fact that it can bring me back to my childhood and some of the best summer memories that I've ever had. We get over to my number 15 and that is Elemental. A movie that I think on the surface sometimes does feel a little bit surface level and what it could have done with its race approaches and specifically what it's trying to do with race but this is a romantic comedy at its heart and if that is the thing that we want to speak about and talk about I think Pixar executed that greatly again would have liked if they touched on that other aspect a little bit more but Elemental is such a sweet movie with some of the best animation in Pixar's history and flat out a film that just makes me feel joyful and I love seeing Wade and Ember come together no matter the odds. And I hope, I really hope that one day we will see another Elemental because I think we deserve to know more about this world. And I think we deserve to see another adventure between Wade and Ember. And really much their story is very small, but it takes place in one big city. And I think that's just it just brought the emotions to me definitely where it gets really hard and i would say 14 and up this is like some of the toughest stuff for pixar because each and every one of these films i consider a classic number 14 is up which is a film that i have like this feeling for where it's like a 4.5 out of 5 it's almost perfect and there's a couple things that like drag it down for me and i just can't push it up anymore but the pros of this movie are so strong and a lot of that all goes towards the first eight minutes of this where it breaks and rips out your heart of carl and ellie's storyline but also where carl ends up by the end where you look at this and what russell and doug and this adventure that they go on one last adventure that adventure is out there and Carl got that with Ellie. He took the house there. And her spirit, even if she's not there, was thriving and alive. And I think as crazy and bonkers as Up gets with like the dogs and the plane and all that stuff, I think that gets a little bit too silly for the tone that they were trying to go for. Up is one of those movies that just hits the right notes. And I imagine that Up will only grow more and more on me the older and older I get. And that's kind of how I felt is that the older and older I get, the more and more I like up and the more and more I come to those terms. And I'm just loving what they're able to do with this. And primarily after getting married this year, there's like aspects of up that really just hit hard for me now. So I love this movie. I love a lot of Pixar. Let's continue. Got my number 13 is the brand new film Inside Out 2, which I fully expect to move up on this list once I actually get to check it out a couple more times. It's a movie that has only grown on me the more and more that I've thought about it over the last few days after seeing it for the first time. And when I walked out of it, I was like, yeah, that's like, almost as good as the first one. It's missing a couple aspects, like the emotional points, like with Bing Bong, and I never cried watching Inside Out 2, but I think it's such a nice progression from the first movie, and what it really felt like was the Toy Story 2 for the Inside Out franchise, and if they continue down this path with Inside Out, I think if we get a third one, or maybe even a fourth one, there is so much development that you can continue within this franchise that I'm a massive fan of. But when I say it's like the Toy Story 2 of this franchise is that they add more characters, you get anxiety, envy, ennui, and embarrassment but it's also a bigger adventure you're exploring more of Riley's mind but at the same point in time it's actually answering questions that I wasn't prepared for it to answer and for it to make me feel like I needed to know and that it's depiction on anxiety and envy were actually two of the things that really took the entire show for a ride and what the first Inside Out did was really showcase to me that hey it's okay to have all these different emotions. It's okay to feel all these different emotions and use them to your possibilities and to your best abilities. Sadness, joy, fear, anger, disgust, whatever it may be, all those things need to work in harmony. And while Inside Out 2 very fastly establishes that for a majority of the characters that all these need to work, it teaches you something new. And it answers a question that I had from the first film about Riley and her emotions 
And now I saw that and got that answer within here. And I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen the movie yet, but they introduce a new thing that I was very surprised in the direction that they took it. And I think it's one of the most beautiful and poetic and honestly poignant things that Pixar has done yet. My number 12 is Ratatouille. Ratatouille is like one of the most grand adventures in Pixar. And for me, it's one of those ones that I feel so sentimental about. I haven't watched this one as much as I probably should have, but it's one that just really hits the spot. And I know that's crazy to say because this is a movie that deals with a rat making food, but his relationship with his family, paralleling to Linguini and his relationship with everyone in his life, and specifically how two unlikely people end up having a friendship even though they can't talk. There's so many brilliant things that a Brad Bird does with Ratatouille that it really just puts a smile on my face. And when you tell someone that, yeah, this is a movie about a rat making food, and it's one of the best things that Pixar's ever made, you roll your eyes at some aspects of that, but at the same time, when you watch it, you're like, this is absolutely brilliant. And I don't know what really touches onto that other than the fact that Ratatouille just feels like a special movie that shouldn't work, but it does. That brings me down to my number 11, and that is Wally, which I'm feeling a little bit sappy today, and that's the reason I'm Wally's so much higher on this list. I usually have Wally falling around the same part of Up, but after getting married this year, I've just really been thinking about this film movie so much and the silent film aspect of the first part of this, whether between Wally and Eva, and then how the film kind of projects itself and still continues to have that romantic film aspect but adding a sci-fi layer about our world and how much we need to actually care about it and to the back half how important that is for everyone involved and when you look at that entire story on a crux of it it's something that again may be a little bit preachy to some but it feels so important and again teaching younger ones yeah we need to take care of our world but also like the love story between Wally and Eva it just really hits the spot. It makes sense for the sentimental values of it all and also the big heart and the smiles the film gives. Wally is just one of those movies that, yeah, you have to watch it at least once a year, put a smile on your face and absolutely enjoy it. Oh, number 10, this movie makes me remember it all the time and that is Coco. Coco is one of the movies that I don't like to rewatch, but I also always want to because it really brings out a good tear in me with that remember me. I'm going to start crying. I'm going to start crying, guys. Uh, Coco, though, is a film that actually makes me want to go hug my grandparents, hug my family members, hug everyone around me and tell them to them that I love them. And I like that Pixar's approach on the Day of the Dead. I think that's a culture that, again, not a lot of films have ever really touched on. And Coco was able to play off of it and also teach kids something new. But also what I loved about it is that so many family members, I feel like pressure us to not go in the direction that maybe we feel that we are chosen to go in. And Coco not only showcases that, but also showcases how we can change and help our family for the better. And that even if we have this big dream that this one thing is the sole thing for us, if it doesn't turn out that way, and maybe that wasn't how it was supposed to be in our family, well, if it's this way, we can still make it work. Now we get into my number nine, which is Soul. It still crushes me that I have never gotten to see this in theaters. I know they put it in theaters earlier this year. I, I didn't have time to go see it, sadly. But Soul for me is Pixar touching on the aspect of why are we put on this earth? What is the meaning of life? And I think for anyone that I've ever had this conversation with after watching Soul, there's different aspects and different viewpoints that we all have from that. But the fact that like you can have this point of view of Joe Gardner wanting to be this musician, hating his day job, and then ends up dying, and his soul goes to the soul land. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what it was called, but he goes there and he meets this other soul. And while some people think the cat stuff is a little bit too silly, and I can understand that, that sequence between the student and, of course, the... <laughs> the other soul that took over Joe Gardner's body and kind of that understanding that, Oh, I'm this kid's hero. Technically, even though I don't want to be doing this, this kid looks up to me in some ways and soul kind of just showcased one aspect of, wow, I was put on this earth for something. And I think that's one meaningful thing that so many people need to be reminded of is that no matter what you're going through, no matter what your days like or wherever you're at in your life, there is a reason you were on this earth. And soul for me just really is soulfully breaking at times 
but a very great soulful reminder of what we needed to hear in our life. Now, my number eight is Monsters, Inc., which is the great tale of the monster that's under your bed, in your closet, coming out to scare you, and it's Sully and Mike who accidentally find a human, and they have to get her home. And this whole aspect of Monsters, Inc. is judging a book by its cover and seeing two lovable people who are... And also touching on the aspect of corporations and how they affect us. So there's this whole aspect of adults being able to viewpoint something else and kids being able to viewpoint something else as well. And having a blast at this. Everyone's learning the same thing, but in a different part of their life. And Monsters, Inc. is just an absolute riot, whether it comes down to the comedy aspect, the parallels between Mike and Sully and how great their relationship is. And in general, playing on monsters. All the designs of the monsters are great. Monsters, Inc. has always been a classic from Pixar and it's one of those ones that I just love this world and that's why I enjoy Monsters University that's why I enjoy Monsters at Work for the most part and I actually wouldn't mind if they did another Monsters Inc one day but now we get into my number seven which is Inside Out Inside Out is a breathtaking look at emotions in our body and like I mentioned when talking about Inside Out 2 I'm gonna be beating a dead horse here basically but I love how it touches on that it's okay to feel everything that you're feeling. It's okay if you're not happy all the time. It's okay if you're not if you're sad right now. It's okay if you feel a little bit of disgust or fear or anger towards something. It's just you got to share those emotions. You have to vent them. You have to express yourself. Don't bottle your emotions up. And I think that's one aspect that a lot of us feel and find ourselves getting to. And I think a lot of adults do it too. They don't, they always feel so suppressed and not wanting to express themselves and Inside Out does that. But it tells it from two different perspectives, seeing what Riley is doing, but at the same time, seeing what joy and sadness and the adventure that they go on and how they come to a mutual respect of themselves. And specifically Joy, who thinks that Riley just needs to be happy. Riley just needs to be happy. But maybe it's okay for her to feel sad sometimes. You can't just always be the happiest person in the entire world. And to center all these emotional changes coming from a giant move, which I feel like most people have gone through in their life, whether it was when they were younger to maybe when they were older, Inside Out is able to touch on that and anyone's able to watch this. And then you jump into the entire great adventure that they go on throughout the brain and the mind and all the emotions and primarily when you meet bing bong bing bong who you not nah, nah, bing bong bing bong and then bing bong just dies and rips your heart out oh man uh bing bong uh rest in peace my dude uh inside out is one of my favorite pixar movies of all time and it's one of those ones that i think if I had seen this first from a Pixar movie, if I was at the right age, this would probably be my favorite one of all time. My number six is Finding Nemo, which Nemo is just an absolute classic character. I love Finding Nemo so much, and it's one of those stories that it feels like a grand adventure in the ocean, and I always, since I was a kid, there's been two things that I love. I love space, and I love the ocean, and getting to go on this adventure all the way across the sea to find Marlon's son, Nemo. And then he comes along the likes with Dory. Their banter's great, seeing what they get to do. And Marlon, who's this worried clownfish, having to go above and beyond his fears. It kind of helps me feel like I can do the same for people who are important in my life. And, you know, you never know what's out there. And then at the same time, you see Nemo, who has to take this approach and come out of his shell to hopefully help and escape as well. Which you get the whole great subplot of what Marlon and Dory are doing and then also what is going on with Nemo and the Tank Gang. The Tank Gang I think is some of the Pixar's best crew and best characters out there. When I always revisit Finding Nemo, it's just a damn joy for me. Now we get into my number five, which is The Incredibles. The Incredibles is one of the best superhero films ever made and it's just a damn good dynamic for it all. It's the midlife crisis for most men as well because Bob Parr is absolutely going through one. And I like that again, and I've always said this, Pixar makes films that kids can enjoy and that adults can really center back and be like, huh, and they can not just be entertained and enjoy as well, but maybe come out feeling a little bit more than they expected. And The Incredibles kind of attacks that. As I've grown up, The Incredibles has only grown more and more on me. And I think also primarily when we look at the likes of superhero genres and superhero films, we also see 
how important it is for The Incredibles to be here and how incredible this movie is, no pun intended. The family aspect, syndrome, the whole thing of like maybe don't look up to your heroes and what happens if you betray people who are fans of yours. So many clever ideas, so many smart things. Brad Bird knocked it out of the park here and it's again one of Pixar's best. If you watched my last Pixar ranking and you followed me for a while, you probably know what my one through four are. And my number four is Toy Story 4. My number three is Toy Story 3. My number two is Toy Story 2. And my number one is Toy Story 1. I know a lot of you guys are going to say that's cheating, that's cheap, but that's how my ranking goes. I love those Toy Story films so much. It is my favorite franchise of all time. It is my favorite movie of all time is Toy Story. And it means the world to me. Like with what Toy Story did for me on such a thematical level and how each and every one of these films has been there for me at a very important time in my life. And yes, I am very worried about Toy Story 5, but I am hopeful because of Andrew Stanton directing it. But the way that Toy Story 4 ended was special. The way that Toy Story 3 ended was special. The way that Toy Story 2, 1, all ended were special. And as I mentioned, each of these films were at a very important part of my life that when I go back and revisit them now, I understand the nuances more and, and I can somehow adapt it to something going on in my life now. And, you know, at the time of it being Toy Story 1, when I first watched it, I remember my sister was on the way and I didn't know how to feel on that. And that was a film that helped me adjust that, yeah, this could be one of my best friends. And now I look at that and my sister is one of my best friends. And then Toy Story 2 kind of takes Woody into a new direction of like, well, where am I going in my life? Who am I supposed to be? And it takes Buzz on a grand adventure as well. And again, while maybe Toy Story 2 is not the most thematically strong one, it, it, for me, it still is because it struck a chord with me of what I needed to do in my life. And then we get to Toy Story 3, which is the grand conclusion for most. And you see Andy leaving for college, giving his toys away, which I clearly never did. But watched this film when I was graduating junior high into high school. And then I watched it again, of course, like countless times through. But again, specifically when I graduated high school and also when I graduated college. It's kind of just been one of those films that feels like there's always a light at the end of the tunnel, no matter where you are going. And I always feel like it's always a bittersweet feeling when you do a big accomplishment like that. And then you get that Toy Story 4, which I was so nervous about because I thought Toy Story 3 was a great ending. And somehow, Pixar built an epilogue that was absolutely needed. Not everyone agrees, and I understand that. This is coming from a hardcore Toy Story fan, which do believe, I, I do believe that the other characters like Buzz, Jesse, Slinky, Rex, all of them needed a little bit more to do. But when I'm looking at this film as just a Woody's perspective, where Woody his entire life has thought, I just need to be the best toy I can for my owner. But the question gets asked is, well, what happens when your owner doesn't give a shit about you anymore? Kids are assholes. They do that. Well, Toy Story 4 touches on that, and it touches on you as a human who maybe, like, you wanted to do something so bad, you dreamt that this was your passion, this is what you're going to do. Well, sideline, it's not. We don't respect that. We don't want that anymore. And something happens where you can't do what you want to do anymore. But maybe someone comes back into your life, a friend, a loved one. Maybe you just discovered that my life is more meaningful than just that. And I like that Toy Story 4 touches on that. I think the ending between all the toys was phenomenal. I don't know what they are going to do with Toy Story 5, but I love the Toy Story franchise, and they're easily my favorite thing that Pixar has ever done. Again, it all comes down to nostalgia. I know that. But I definitely want to hear your guys' thoughts down below in the comment section, so make sure to leave your thoughts down there. Hit that like and subscribe button. And of course, until next time, stay classy. Stay classy.